sorry. <laughs> do things do have unintended consequences, don't they? <clears throat> so yeah, once we're done with class, we need, we need to, to work on that form for that form sent to, to Rakovich here. So Cauchy's integral formula. So what I'm hoping happens today is we don't get stuck and I cover a few theorems today because um, like the proofs I have to go over today, I think they're important to be in the course, but I'm not so sure that they actually, um, you know, if I was strapped for time, I might cut them out, you know, because the, the proofs are interesting, yeah, but they also, I'm not sure that they actually illustrate computational techniques, you know. Um, but nevertheless, we should all see these things. So a theorem. Um, let D be bounded domain. With piecewise smooth boundary. Right. If F of Z is holomorphic on D with continuous um, derivative f prime of z on D and f of z and f prime of z extend continuously Um, to the boundary of D, right? Then for each Z in D, we have F of Z is equal to 1 over 2 pi I integral over the boundary of D, F of W, DW, over W minus Z. All right. So let's prove this thing. So let's assume D and F are as stated in the theorem. All right. And fix a point Z in D. All right. So fix a particular point, Z and D. All right. And D is open, hence Z is an interior point. So we can, we can choose an epsilon greater than zero. Right. So since D open can select epsilon greater than zero such that the disk of radius epsilon, well, such that D, here it is. Um, well, excuse me, that's not what I call D epsilon. So D, I don't even have a name for this thing. It's, this, is, this is such that this, I mean, we do have a notation for it. Um, the notation, I guess, was D epsilon Z, actually. Right, so what that is, is W in the complex is such that um, the modulus of uh, W minus Z is less than epsilon, right? Now, since D is open, we have that this is a subset of D, right? We can select epsilon such that that open disk is a subset of D, right? And then we can define <coughs> Define d sub epsilon, which is <laughs> unfortunate. Like I, I mean, the notation. I'm going to stick with the notation in the notes, but it is unfortunate that's so much like this because this is really something different. Here, what I'm doing is d minus um, d epsilon of z. Okay, at this point, I think a picture is is needed here. So my notes could, of course, be improved with a picture here, right? But um, 
So D is a domain, right? So I don't know what D looks like. It could be any any kind of any kind of weird stuff, right? Guess some. Right. So there's there's D, <clears throat> and I'll just draw the boundaries solid. But again, it could have partly fuzzy, you know, the domain. Excuse me. Oh, D is a domain. That means it's an open connected. So I guess the bounded should be the edge should be fuzzy, shouldn't it? But the bound. So I've drawn this is the boundary of D I just drew. Okay. So Z is a fixed point somewhere in there, right? And we've, we're drawing this uh, epsilon disk around there, right? D sub epsilon centered at Z. And um, I can zoom in a bit. So, Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so here's perhaps a picture of my, my epsilon. There's, all right, so D epsilon is the, you know, where, where is that? It's like this region, right? All of that, right? So it's missing inside this, the blue circle, but it, it's like that, right? So, and um, so there it is. All right, so what else can we say here? <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, I said the boundary. Uh, bu 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 bu. Bounded domain. I guess, see, the thing is, there could also be other holes. Like, my, my picture of D is not quite, I mean, it's okay, but D could also have other holes in it, you know, that's possible. All right? It's just a bounded domain, okay? Um, so, what's, the, what's the, the boundary of D? What's the orientation of it? Clockwise? on the outer boundary, right? Counterclockwise, rather. Counterclockwise on the outer boundary. So as you walk along it, you're on, you see the thing on your left. And that means we're going to go clockwise on the inner boundary, so that it's on my left, right? Inner boundaries are oriented opposite of outer boundaries. Um, great. And um, so this one, likewise, right, would be, um, since it's an interior boundary, if I, if I was to talk about the boundary, the boundary of D epsilon, right, it's the boundary of D unioned with what? The, you know, the circle um, of radius epsilon centered at Z, right? If I call this thing, I think I call it gamma, what did I call it? I called it gamma minus, I called it gamma minus epsilon. For this, I give the gamma minus epsilon. Um, I said is the is the uh, the clockwise oriented circle here. This is that that blue blue clockwise oriented circle of radius epsilon centered at z. Um, okay, great. Now, what else can we say? How about g of w? I define g of w. All right, so let g of w. be the thing we're integrating here, which is f of w over w minus z, right? So then what's g prime of, what would g prime of w be? So we got f prime of w, right, um, over w minus z minus f of w over w minus z squared by usual calculus. So you could do the product rule and the chain rule there. If you wanted to, you could just do quotient rule, you know, but I'll just write it like that. Okay, so let's see here. So what, what do we have? Um, 
So we, we can observe both g of w and g prime of w are continuous on you know, d epsilon and extend continuously to the boundary of d epsilon, right? Agree? Because of, to get, you go past the, you go a little bit past the blue circle, go inside, well that's also where we're assuming, where? We're assuming that f and f prime are continuous there, right? But the formula for f, there, there's the formula for g and the formula for g prime just involve f, f prime, and division by something which is non-zero because we're not, you know, we're not to the center of the circle where we run into trouble, okay? So, and what else do we know? Also, g of w is holomorphic on this thing, yeah? So we have a function which is holomorphic and has continuous um, itself and its derivative extension to the, the boundary of the of the of the um, of the re the region, and so that means we can apply Cauchy's theorem, right? So thus, by Cauchy's theorem, right, which we proved last time, we have that the integral over the boundary of d epsilon of f of w over w minus z dw is equal to zero, right? But notice that this gives us that the integral over the boundary of D, well, up here I'll say, this of course implies the integral over the boundary of D of F of W over W minus Z dW plus the integral over gamma minus epsilon F of W over w minus z dw is equal to zero. But that I can trade for the integral of f of w dw over w minus z is equal to the integral of over gamma plus and epsilon. So what I did was I moved it to the other side, which gave me a minus, right? But then I absorbed that minus by disorienting, reorienting re the circle um, counterclockwise rather than clockwise. So that changed two minuses. That gave me a plus there. All right. So, um, and then we just calculate this thing. All right. So how does this how's this calculate? How's this calculate? Well, gamma. Let me do it in a different color here. What's the parameterization of that that circle there? This is this guy. W equal to what? So it's this blue circle, right? So Z yeah. plus the radius is epsilon, yeah? E to the, say, I T. Um, zero less than or equal to T less than or equal to 2 pi. So what's W minus C? Mm-hmm. Yeah, epsilon e to the i t. So let's see here. We have integral from zero to two pi f of z plus epsilon e to the i t, right? And then dw was epsilon i e to the i t dt, right? And then w minus z is epsilon e to the i t. So what we have is i times the integral from 0 to 2 pi f of z plus epsilon e to the i t. Um, well, I could do, I could rewrite it like this. This is dt over 2 pi, right? And I could put a 2 pi out here. I wanted to. Why would I want to do that? Uh, 
oh yeah, but why would I, why would I do this, this funny uh, multiply by 2 pi, divide by 2 pi? What, what's the thing I put in the pr purple parentheses here? Ah, so th what that is, is the mean value. That's the mean value of f over the circle of radius epsilon, which the mean value property for the holomorphic f, right? Was what the the value of the 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 value of it at the at the at the center, right? Yeah. So the center is z. So this is two pi i f of z by mean value property, which we proved for holomorphic functions, and of course f is holomorphic on the disk um, of radius epsilon centered at z. So yes, the function that we're integrating, f of w over w minus z, that runs into trouble at w equal to z. But after we did these calculations, we got past that trouble, and we just come back to the problem of integration of f. And because of the mean value property, we get this. And that then immediately gives you Cauchy's integral theorem. So. That's, yeah, I think that's pretty, oh, no, yeah, pretty, pretty. Uh, yeah, yeah, what this does for us is, is it, 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 it does some, some rather onerous calculations. Now, <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so now that once you know Cauchy's integral formula, we can formally, well, it, is it formal? I don't know. It depends on how much analysis you're willing to uh, kind of gloss over, I suppose. Uh, there is a better proof in the notes, okay? Um, but maybe we'll do that. I don't know. Let me, let me start with this. If I know that, um, so what do I have? Cauchy's integral formula. I have f of z is equal to what is it? 1 over 2 pi i integral over the boundary of d, right? Um, f of w dw over w minus z, right? So what I can do is I can differentiate this with respect to z. f prime of z is equal to, well, 1 over 2 pi i um, so we usually, we use a partial, we tend to use this notation because I'm thinking there's, well, let me say it this way. I'll put ddz out here. Let's not quibble over the notation. Um, okay, so, so far I haven't really said anything except that the 2 pi i pulls out, right? But then, um, if we can switch the integral and the bound, which again is in general a sketchy thing to do, but so look at it this way: if you can, you can you can flip integrals and bounds at least as a exploratory procedure to see what formula might be true, right? I sound like a physicist. No, the physicists would just say you flip the integral and the bound. Um, they wouldn't say anything about that might possibly be okay. They just say, yeah, you know, you just do it. Uh, Feynman did it, it makes it okay, right? Um, but when we differentiate this, we get f of w over w minus z squared. And notice that there's, like, there's one minus one that comes from the minus one power, but there's another one that comes from the chain rule on the inside function, which is w minus z. So that, those two minuses um, cancel out. And just give you that. And there it is. That's Cauchy's generalized integral formula with m equals to 1. And then if we can do it once, we can do it again, right? So f prime prime of z is 1 over 2 pi. So I like this in part because if for some reason you forgot Cauchy's generalized in integral formula, this gives you, you know, a path to derive it, doesn't it? which is in itself valuable. 
So I just went ahead and flipped the bound, flipped the integral and the differentiation to start with, because that's what we're going to do. And so then when you differentiate a second time, this time you bring down, you get a 2. Yeah. You get a minus 2, and then you get a minus 1 from the, from the uh, you know, um, minus 2 because it's the minus 2 power times minus 1 because the derivative of the inside function is minus 1. So there it is, f prime prime of z, right? So each time we differentiate, well, that is, but I'm going to leave it like that. You, you're right, you could simplify it. f prime 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 of z, 1 over 2 pi i. So now we'll get 3 times 2, right? I could write this as 2 times 1 to be more sort of in your face about what's going on here. Um, 3 times 2 times 1. Why did you write times 1? I don't know. Point of uh, pattern recognition, I guess. f of w dw over w minus z to the fourth power. Right, so maybe you recognize the pattern at this point. Aha, if we differentiate z f m times, right? So the m mth derivative of z is going to be m times m minus 1 times m minus 2 times m minus, that's m factorial. So we have m factorial over 2 pi i integral over the boundary of d f of w dw over w minus z to the what? So we had a, so this was like f of f, this is the third derivative, right? We had a 3 here, we put a 4 there. We had a 2 here, we put a 3 there. A first derivative gave me a square over here. And then Cauchy's integral formula puts a zeroth derivative here and a first power here. It's always one more we're dividing by. So we do m plus 1. And that right there, that is Cauchy's generalized integral formula. Let me change the letters to make it a little bit more useful for our purposes. We could also write this as the mth derivative at z naught is equal to m factorial over 2 pi i integral over the boundary of d, right? f of z dz over z minus z naught. So I swapped out my z for w in my, um, uh, my z, well, I swapped out z for z naught and w for z. That's what I did. So here's another way to write Cauchy's generalized integral formula. And then finally one more, which is oftentimes what we like to use, which is that the integral over the boundary of d of f of z dz over z minus z naught to the m plus 1 power. Well, that's just equal to um, 2 pi i um, times the mth derivative evaluated at z naught divided by m factorial. So this is actually often how we use that formula to calculate an integral. Now, to be fussy, that's not a proof, right? Um, and the proof, the careful, somewhat careful proof of Cauchy's integral formula, I give on page 87 of the notes. And um, I just simply do not have the patience to show that to you today. So <laughs> we're going to go on. And besides, I've, I've showed you a derivation of it, if nothing else. So there it is. But the, the proof just involves, um, well, let me, let me just say it in words. I feel bad to not say something. Um, so to, uh, well, it is, it is somewhat involved. It, it, it uh, how to explain it carefully. It takes a half hour to explain it carefully, but this, I mean, it, it can be done. It just involves 
involves binomial theorem and expanding things carefully and we're, we're going to go on. Um, let's see here. Let's look at example, the next example here. <clears throat> see, I'd rather spend, I'd rather spend the time in here today going over this example slowly <laughs> than that proof. I think this proof is important to go through because it shows you that that mean value property, it's not just something we were, I mean, that's a part of the story here, right? The mean value property um, for holomorphic functions. It, it played an important step in that proof today, didn't it? It did. Yes. All right. So. All right, so example. Four, point four, point four. So I say, I start out by pointing out z to the fourth plus i is equal to zero for what? For z, that's an element of the fourth roots of minus i, right? Which, what is that? Yeah, so let's see, the way we do that, let's start out with this, minus i is e to the minus pi over 2, pi i over 2, right? That tells me that the fourth root, principal fourth root of minus i is e to the minus i pi over 8, right? Which then tells me that... Um, the minus fourth roots of the fourth roots of minus i include e to the minus i pi over eight, and then you know minus that, right? Also i times that. So i times that is what e to the four i pi over eight, right? So I e to the five i pi over 8, and then minus that, you know? Great. So those are the zeros of, those are the zeros of z to the fourth plus i, okay? And um, so I say, well, consider, consider the circle modulus of z minus 1 equal to 1. Let's draw a picture here. So that's this circle, all right? And um, let me put the unit circle kind of around, you know, put the unit circle here. my unit circle. All right. And let's see, let's picture the picture the zeros of z to the fourth plus i. Where are they? Where are those those things? There's um, so e to the pi i e to the minus i pi over eight, that's kind of like right about here ish, right? There's another one that's like here. That's the five, um, five pi over eight. So like, what's five eighths? Well, I see, what is, how many degrees is five pi over eight is really my question. So we've got, you know, five times 180 over eight. 120? No, it's going to be less than 90. Uh, 
it's 900 divided by 8, eight isn't it? Oh, wait a minute. Did I do that wrong? Oh, wait a minute, you're right. Oh, man. Did I do that wrong? Oh, curses. Oh, look, look, look what I did. Look what I did wrong. Look what I did wrong. Was this, were we multiplying, should we be multiplying e to the i pi over 8? No. Minus. See? Minus. Minus, which gives me 4 minus 1, which doesn't give me 5. It gives me, no, 4 minus 1, 3. And then 3. Okay, there we go. What, what is 3 pi over 8 in terms of degrees? Five forty, right? Yeah. So five hundred sixty would be seven times eight, right? Seven times eighty. So this is a little shy of eighty degrees. This is like wait, I'm an idiot. I can't do math today. What was five hundred forty divided by eight? Six, six, sixty. If it was six hundred forty, it'd be eighty, right? Seven, no, seven times eight is fifty-six. So it, it is. You're right. It's it's a little shy of seventy degrees, right? So it's like sixty-eight. All right. Anyway, this is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> my point to you is. Um, Oh, wait a minute. Huh. Ooh. Well? Oh. So, well, my picture is deceiving because apparently, my, I mean, this picture is right. I just, I can't see, when I think about 68 degrees, I'm not sure. Man, it, it's, 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 it's in the place here where it's kind of like, is it there or is it? Like, is it inside or outside, you know? On your notes, it's outside. And my notes, it's outside. If uncertain, how can we check whether or not this point, which is what? E to the 3 pi i over 8, right? How can we check whether or not that's inside the circle? What we got to do? We got to check the... Uh, the equations won't help us. We know it's not on the circle. Well, we know it's on the unit circle. But the, Oh, but you can be lazier than that. See, because what you can do is you can just take the, uh, here is three e to 3 pi over 3 pi i over 8, right? And then subtract 1 from it, right? And you calculate the modulus of that. This gives you the distance from 1, right? So if that distance is less than, less than 1, it's inside the circle. If it's greater than 1, it's outside the circle. So what does that look like? That looks like the square root of cosine 3 pi over 8 minus 1 squared, right, plus the sine of 3 pi over 8 squared, which I cannot do without a calculator. So, yeah. Well, we know that's yeah. like, well, 3 pi over 8, that's 9. So, it'd be like, uh, so 9 gives that to the extreme, so that would be huge. <laughs> So this, this gives you a cosine squared plus sine squared, which gives you a 1. So you get 2, yeah? And then minus 2 cosine 3 pi over 8, I think. So this, when I square that out, I get a, a 1, yeah? I get a 1 squared, and I get a cosine squared. This gives me a sine squared. Sine squared plus cosine squared gives me a 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. The cross term here is minus 2 cosine 3 pi over 8. Um, so... Point three eight two. So we get square root of two 
times one mi times what you say point seven seven six five which is what one point two three four which of course is greater than one which goes to prove that my picture is right oh, it's up square root of that is about one point one which is still greater than one so so what a sloppy picture may or may not be informative about. We need to check with algebra, of course, right? All right, so, yeah. As is usually the case, the fussy details are not calculus, are they? They're really the pre-calculus of the problem is the, the algebra of the problem is often the fussier part than the calculus. <laughs> it's just algebra, right? So here's the other two points here and here, right? These are the um, the zeros, right? Um, now you might be wondering, what are you doing? Because at the moment I'm just looking at these two circles and looking at the zeros of that polynomial, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what? Okay. So now with all that in hand, I can calculate the integral of dz so I can take the, so I'm going to integrate around the blue circle c minus 1 equal to 1 in the counterclockwise fashion of dz over z to the fourth plus i so that is So factoring, so I have z minus um, e to the minus i pi over 8, z plus e to the minus i pi over 8, z minus e to the, oh, I just use i's. So I'll do it here too. So e to the i, e minus i pi over 8, z plus i. So I, I never bothered. In the, in the notes, I didn't calculate the, uh, the 3 pi thing, pi rate. But. Okay, so that's just factor, factor theorem, right? Just the factor theorem. Yep. But um, the point is you can think of... So what's, this is really, so let's see here, I can write this as the integral over z minus 1 equal to 1, counterclockwise, yeah, of um, f of z dz over z minus z naught, where z naught equals to Let's see here. So inside this blue circle, there is one troublesome thing, right? Um, like I, I would be able to say, so like f of z, if you like, or let's see, the function, 1 over, one over z to the fourth plus i is almost holomorphic. within modulus of z minus 1 less than or equal to 1, right? There is one troublesome point for this function. Not the origin. This point. That's the, that's the 0. And so otherwise, it's holomorphic, right? So if you factor out, so here's z naught I'm thinking of as being um, e to the minus i pi over 8. And so w w that, that, that's which one? That's this, this guy right here, right? So what is f of z? Sorry. 
everything else. That's everything else. Or if you want, you could use some color coding, right? It's, it's this, p it's, it's one times all of this. You know, that's, that's f of z. And then, okay, so what's this integral equal to? It's equal to 2 pi i f of what? z naught. It's like Cauchy's integral formula. which is 2 pi i divided by, well, 2 e to the minus i pi. I'm really, wish, I'm really starting to think I should have given this. I, I'm, at this point, this is stupid to do at this point, but I'm going to do it. Minus i pi over 8, this is equal to alpha. Oh, uh, yours equals a row? Okay, row then. So, row, row, 2 row, plugging in to here, 2 row, and then what? Rho minus I rho, rho plus I rho, which give us 2 pi i over 2 rho, rho squared plus rho squared. So 2 pi i over 4 rho cubed, also known as pi i over 2 and um, e to the minus i pi over 8 cubed, okay. which is i pi over 2 e to the 3 pi i over 8, if I haven't made a mistake. What I have in the notes. Must be right, right? <laughs> All right. I'm going to skip ahead. We've got, what, 10 minutes left? Five minutes left? We only have five minutes left, don't we? rats. I really wanted to show you Gorsau's theorem today. Um, yeah, we could, yeah, we could state it. Sure. I tell you what, let me not do that. Um, but Gorsau's theorem is what is the one that shows us that um, complex differentiable implies continuously differentiable. So that's the, one, of the, one of the pieces that we keep assuming, but we don't need to assume it can be proved. Uh, let's, do, let's do one more calculation here. Um, let's calculate the um, integral, let's do a little bit simple here, integral over the unit circle, right, um, counterclockwise, right, and this time we'll do sine of uh, z squared. dz over z to the third there. We'll make it too horrible. So let's see here. Can we do this? So the, um, like our, we're, we're thinking about using uh, Cauchy's generalized integral formula, right? Here f of z is sine of z cubed, right? z squared, rather. All right. So here my z naught is 0. What's that? Yeah, that's my point, is we can use this straight up. So uh, my, my, my question to you, though, is, is it clear that this function is holomorphic um, inside the disk. Well, that's true because, in fact, f of z is entire. Um, sine of z squared is differentiable 
with continuous derivative on the whole complex plane. So, um, actually, if I had stated the the the, the, the what's that? Uh, well, well, we'll have to do it here. So the this says what then? This is going to be what? Two pi i. How's it, how's the formula go? I've forgotten. So the integral we're supposed to do two pi i. So what gets a little bit dicey here is you have to think about what's m equal to. Here, m plus 1 is 3. That's the, that's, the, that's the thing that we often will get tripped up on. So here, m equals to 2. So we're supposed to two, two, uh, second derivative evaluated at 0 divided by 2 factorial, right? So we have to now differentiate. So to figure out what that is, well, is it? Is it though? F prime of z is, yeah, uh, 2z cosine of z squared, right? F prime prime is 2 cosine of z squared um, minus 4z squared sine of z squared. So in fact, F prime prime of 0 is 2. So we get 2 pi i times 2 divided by 2. So 2 pi i is that integral. I have a minute. So let me kind of Talk about what that means. We have the sine of x squared minus y squared plus 2ixy divided by z cubed, if I remember right, is x cubed. Oh, goodness. What is, what is the formula for z cubed in terms of x and y? What's x plus iy cubed? So we, yeah, we get x cubed minus 3xy squared minus y, oh, there's an i here. Because i cubed is minus i, yeah. So we get x cubed minus 3x squared, xy squared, plus i times 3x squared y minus y cubed, right? And then you've got dx plus i dy, yeah? So we're integrating this over the circle, counterclockwise oriented, right? So, um, but that sign is what? That's actually, so we got sine of, x squared minus y squared, um, cosh of 2xy, um, and then minus um, cosine of x squared minus y squared. Um, so when I, when I do the, I do sine plus, I, did, I got a sine of 2ix, and then the, I think that brings out an i. The for half an i. Yeah, so what is, is sine, sine of 2ix, what's that? I sinh 2 of xy. So it's i sinh 2 of xy? Okay. So that i times this i gives me minus, and so I get minus cosine of x squared minus y squared times the sinh of 2xy. divided by um, this when you rational, it, oh, it's still not done. Oh, it's so much horrible, so much more horrible than just that. See, my bad. Um, listen, I said, I, I said we have a minute, right? Um, I would need five minutes for this. Let me sketch where this is going, though. So to make this, to, to 
what I'm trying to say is this can be recast, right? As the integral of some function, right? Some function of x and y, which is rather complicated, divided by x squared minus 3xy squared squared plus 3x squared y minus y cubed squared plus i times some other function, I'll call it f2 of xy. And that f1 and x2 are based on sines of x squared minus y squared, cosines of x squared minus y squared, cinches of 2xy, coshes of 2xy, all that. So the, the integral, you know, and uh, it's, oh, it's worse than that because it, it's worse than that, right? Because I, I, I'm, I'm neglecting still the details because this is something like, I should really say, this really is supposed to be something like, you know, p1 dx plus q1 dy, and this is really supposed to be something like p2 of dx plus q2 dy, where, um, you know, the p1 and the q1 and the, here p1, q1, p2, q2, these are the functions which are cosines and sines of x squared minus y and cinches and coshes of 2xy. I was starting to derive it here, right? My point to you is we've calculated the line integral of those vector fields around this circle. And what this calculation shows that we did in two minutes is that the integral of p1 dx plus q1 dy over that around the circle is zero. And it shows that the integral of p2 dx plus q2 dy is equal to 2 pi. Because the imaginary part of the integral is 2 pi i and the real part integrated to zero. I should have picked a more simple example where we could actually find the explicit formulas. Maybe I'll still find time to do that in another lecture. But I, I think we sometimes, it's easy enough to like apply the theorem and go, oh, nice, easy. It is, but if you look at what we're really doing at the level of real notation, it is phenomenally cal complicated. And so a very evil calculus instructor can reverse engineer problems back to like real calculus because they know how to do it in the complex way. <laughs> I've done that in advanced calculus, but using my A calculus stuff. <laughs>